Hello and welcome to a History Film Forum discussion of the new film, The People vs. Agent Orange, which will debut on PBS's Independent Lens series on June 28, 2021. I'm Chris Wilson, Director of Experience Design at the National Museum of American History. The History Film Forum programs are brought to you with, through the generosity of Dan Manat and Democracy Films. And I'd also like to thank our partners at Smithsonian Associates. When we began the History Film Forum, we really wanted to focus on the fact that so many people learn about history through film and provide a forum to discuss that. This film is a great example of that fact. There are so many things I learned in this film on about Agent Orange, both in Vietnam and its use domestically and the tragic consequences of that. That's one of the reasons I think that this film has gained so many awards, including the uh, Eric Barnow Award from the Organization of American Historians for this year for the best historical documentary and the Jury Award from the Eugene Environmental Film Festival in Eugene, Oregon, which said that this was everything an environmental film should be. I'd like to present now a conversation with the filmmakers, Alan Adelson and Kate Deverna, along with activist Carol Van Strum, moderated by our own curator, Frank Blazich from the National Museum of American History. Thank you. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for this wonderful conversation about a fantastic documentary. The People versus Agent Orange tells several stories and the history it presents offers several lessons. Some are predictable and well-known, but some unfortunately unfamiliar, hidden and surprising. Let's first get into the facts. What is Agent Orange? And I open that to the floor. Agent Orange was a mixture, a 50-50 mixture of the herbicides 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T that was sprayed over millions of acres in Vietnam and also in the United States. I would add that it was the first um, occasion of ecocide. Uh, crime that has not yet been codified, but implies the destruction of the earth and its inhabitants. Agent Orange was sprayed for a 10 year period between 1961 and 1971 over a vast expanse of Vietnam equivalent to the size of the state of Massachusetts or the country of Belgium. Um, it was highly controversial early on. And um, as it's uh, 10 year, as the 10 year herbicidal war went on, more and more reports of illnesses and deformities uh, occurring in Vietnam uh, began to create worldwide pressure against the United States' use of the chemicals, but the military persisted for that entire decade. Thank you. And in the film, Dr. David Zeller refers to its use in Vietnam as, as the deadliest use of chemical warfare in history, as we mentioned previously. Could you describe its use as a weapon of war and what were some of the immediate effects of the use of Agent Orange? It was um, a rather typically um, misdirected military initiative, if I can um, insert my own um, subjective uh, retrospective view, Frank. Um, the US had uh, a high motivation to stop the infiltration of communists from the north of Vietnam into the south, where we uh, were supporting a puppet government uh, run by a guy named Jim. And they couldn't spot the enemy, the infiltrators, and thought if they destroyed the jungle, it would make it uh, easier for them to uh, cease the infiltration. So with extraordinary American arrogance, they set about um, really 
changing nature in a tremendously uh, floral, um, verdant um, jungle environment. And they set out uh, to spray and kill the trees, um, the herbicide from these C-123 so-called provider aircraft would um, filter down onto the jungle canopy. And within weeks or months, the, those trees would be dead. Unfortunately and um, ironically, by killing the jungle canopy and the treetops, they enabled sunlight to reach the forest floor. And then immediately um, huge grasses, currently known as American grasses and bamboo grew up, which provided even better coverage for the Viet Cong on the ground um, than the tall jungle trees might have done. Nonetheless, um, they persisted with the spraying for that full 10 year period. Well, it's something you need to add to that though, is that they, another stated purpose of the spraying of these poisons was to kill the crops that were feeding the so-called enemy. And um, that was definitely part of their program. And of course, it not only killed crops, it poisoned what was left of them and people consumed them. And I'd add to that, Carol, that um, through the uh, crop destruction, the Americans were able to force um, the Vietnamese into what they called strategic hamlets, which were in fact concentration camps. Um, so that um, the Vietnamese um, rice growers, peasants, farmers, uh, could not commune with the infiltrators, much less feed them. Um, and in that respect, um, I suppose the military objective was partially accomplished. Yeah, and another use, of course, that is often ignored is that these were, these chemicals, same chemicals were sprayed on every American military base in Vietnam, sprayed very, very heavily much more heavily than the aerial spraying and to kill everything that grew. So they would have bare ground, supposedly making it easier for, <laughs> for our troops. But um, it meant that almost anybody who served in Vietnam in any capacity was exposed to these things to say nothing, of course, of the um, Vietnamese people. I think the film, uh, thank you both for very complete answer, I should say. <laughs> now, this very tragic part of the story is known, but I think what viewers of the film will find very surprising is the use of these chemicals domestically in the United States. And I would ask if, uh, Carol, if you would like to talk a little bit about this domestic use of what we know as Agent Orange here in the United States. Well, these same chemicals were developed originally by the military basically, but they were also promoted heavily for agriculture in this country. And of course, as soon as they were banned in Vietnam, thanks to Congress actually taking action, um, <laughs> uh, the entire supply and, and production of these same chemicals in this country had been for the military. And now they had this whole superstructure of factories and backed up supplies that they, they were, the military was not gonna use. And they promoted them incredibly heavily for forestry use, supposedly to kill weed trees um, so that they could only grow commercially valuable trees. Um, they were used also promoted heavily for growing of rice, for rangeland, and also for roadside and right-of-way uses along railroads. So 
the same chemicals ended up being used very, very heavily domestically. And, and that was how we got involved in Oregon was their use in forestry. And, that would, and the, the follow-up question I would ha have to that, particularly since the film looks at the, forest, uh, the forestry industry in Oregon, how essential is the spraying of herbicide for the timber industry in Oregon to ensure successful reforestation? Are there not alternatives that could be used or do we even need herbicides to begin with? Well, no, we don't. I mean, I, even the Army Corps of Engineers long ago pointed out there, <laughs> these trees had millions of years to <laughs> adapt to the exact climate and soil we have here. They don't need help. But um, the, uh, yeah, they were presumed to kill off all the brush that grows up after clear cutting. And that's the root of the problem is clear cutting. Uh, I don't, very few people, and the film shows this, have, have are aware of the vast areas that are basically strip mined in the United States and particularly in the Northwest. The, everything is cut down to bare dirt and then poisoned to make sure nothing else will grow there. And then they plant their Douglas fir. So the whole, the whole problem starts basically with clear cutting and where like the national forest stopped clear cutting, they stopped spraying because they didn't need to anymore. When there's selective cutting, they don't need to. And um, that's the root of the problem is clear cutting. And when you and your family were living in rural Oregon, with the beauty of nature all around you, how did you begin to experience or begin to know that there was a problem with the use of these herbicides? Well, my children got sprayed. They were, we have a river that runs through and next to our property. And they were uh, also the road, the only road in our valley um, runs along the river. And the children were down fishing and playing in the river. And a truck came along and sprayed them. Uh, directly probably I mean who knows what we don't know whether the guys on the truck saw them they were in shirt sleeves and shorts they had no protective gear at all so they obviously thought the stuff was safe and they were spraying like contests with high pressure hoses to see how far they could shoot it so they were spraying right into the river and of course they sprayed it right on the children and by that night they were all really really sick and when I called the road department to, to ask them what was in that truck, because we had no idea. And they said, oh, it's absolutely safe. It's just a mixture of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. They're just herbicides. They only hurt plants. And, uh, and then I asked them, I said, well, if it's so safe, are you sure you didn't put the wrong thing in the tank? No, they were absolutely sure it was what they said it was. Well, when we went down to the river the next day and saw what had happened there, um, it became clear that something was really wrong. That there were dead ducklings floating, merganser ducklings floating along the edge, dead fish, dead crayfish, uh, and in the bushes, a dead hermit thrush on her nest. And the you couldn't ignore it. There was something awful had happened. And the only thing we knew that had happened was this spray truck. So we started researching those chemicals, especially when the Forest Service, a few weeks later, sprayed the same things on the ridge right above our place and with helicopters. And it all drifted down. It killed our garden. And a few weeks later, we ended up with chicks and ducklings and geese hatching with Oh, no wings, feet on backwards, crossed beaks. Um, and that had, we had been raising poultry for years and that had never happened before. Mm. So that was when we seriously knew something was wrong, but we didn't know what to do about it until uh, <laughs> a so-called forestry professor who had actually promoted the use of Agent Orange literally on Oregon forests, 
he was from Oregon State University, a man named Michael Newton. He published a article in the local paper saying how wonderful these, this new tool was for forestry using these herbicides. And I kind of saw red when I read that and just wrote a, a response to it that the paper printed saying, you know, maybe uh, Dr. Newton thinks these are wonderful, but I'm presuming he doesn't live out here and see what happens. And I just proceeded to tell in my letter what happened to us. And that started the whole thing rolling because suddenly people were calling and visiting from the entire, our whole area saying, oh my God, we didn't know what was causing these things. The same thing happened to us. And we got together and uh, ended up suing the U.S. Forest Service, which believe me, we were all so naive. We first thought all we had to do was tell them, oh, look what's happening. This is not a good thing. And they would stop. And of course they didn't. So we ended up going to court in federal court and won an injunction against the use of what was thought to be the only dioxin containing uh, um, ingredient of Agent Orange. But at the time, that's what was they, we were told. As you mentioned, uh, Dr. Michael Newton and Oregon State University presented these chemicals as safe. They were effective for forestry. It seems there's a lot of complicity going on here. And we can look at the military and the chemical companies. But it also suggests with much of history that it's more complicated than we first imagined. What does this say about the obligation of academics and their institutions to factor the environment, nature, and the public good into their work? Has this work, has his work, the university's involvement, ever been ethically questioned for the damage it caused? Well, only very, very recently, some people are finally looking at that, but you're absolutely right. The problem, and with all of these chemicals, first of all, as both the film and my book that it's partly based on, uh, go into detail is that most of these chemicals are, if they're tested for safety at all, the tests are done by the chemical companies. Most of them have been proven either fraudulent or not existent, but, um, the government, the EPA has continued to register them anyway, knowing that there's faulty or non-existent safety testing. Mm -hmm. And the universities, because they depend so heavily on funding from the same companies that make these things, the research that goes into promoting the use of them gets done, but the research that might show the hazards of them is never funded. And there's where we have a big problem. And then there's a further problem of, of really horrendous pressure on scientists that do discover dangers being muzzled or even intimidated into not publishing. And that's been part of the whole history of how these things now have become the conventional way of growing anything. And <laughs> it's all a fraud. Well, thank you. And activism, which you are a gold star representative of the power of environmental activism in the United States. I, I have to ask then, so I don't want to leave uh, Kate and Alan here <laughs> sitting quietly through the whole interview. How did this incredible story first come to your attention? And in, in introduction to getting me, Carol, and the later Madame Tron. Well, it's a rather typical New York story in its origins, Frank. Um, I was at a party thrown by an actress uh, I had worked with in a stage production and a young woman approached me and said, so you're a filmmaker. Um, you have to do something about these poor forgotten children in Vietnam. And she put her cell phone in my face and showed me the most disturbing images I think I've ever seen of human beings, um, painfully distorted um, by chemistry. And I would add, um, uh, 
without um, much comfort or care either, though the Vietnamese people struggled to look after them. I was resistant. Um, a documentary for me uh, and Kate can take many years. We go deep and a film like this requires it and there would be enemies. And this was a, a story about an old problem that the United States had well, when we have plenty of new ones. But the investigative journalist in me uh, would not lay back quietly. I had a voice, I think, pressing my consciousness, even as um, Angela uh, Rauscher was showing me these photographs of the orphan, uh, Agent Orange orphans in, in Vietnam. My consciousness was thinking if these poor, helpless, suffering children were the result, the conscious result of decisions made by executives in the chemical industry, and it could be shown that for profit motives, they went ahead and attacked science knowingly and these children resulted, then such a documentary would be a very cautionary uh, tale well worth sharing with humanity. And here we are, Frank, 10 years later, um, two weeks before that film will go on uh, nationwide PBS. And um, the problem continues to persist and the problems in our civic society, in controlling profit motives, in controlling the exposure of our citizenry to toxins, um, there is so much um, still left to be redressed. Thank you. And I would ask if you could, if we could expand, could you talk about some of the health effects, or the, the, the damage, if you will, that Agent Orange, Orange can cause to a human body and explain some of this for our listeners or viewers, excuse me. They're very, very widespread, Frank. The uh, Veterans Administration uh, covers um, Vietnam veterans who had boots on the ground or were even on now on waterways that were exposed to um, the runoff of Agent Orange, many, many soft tissue cancers, um, uh, diabetes. diabetes. Now they've just recently added Parkinson's-like um, uh, symptoms. Um, uh, hypertension, the list goes on. And um, of course, anyone can uh, use Google um, to get that complete list. Um, I think we'll have it posted on our website as well, the website for the film, um, Agent R, um, www.agentorange, uh, the people versus agent orange.com. <laughs> Thanks. Kate is worth much more than just correcting me, but, um, uh, and I will post that website. Um, there are many, many resources there. The, um, perhaps the most stunning and consequential um, uh, result of exposure to Agent Orange is the possibility of deformity in um, the children of our uh, military service people. And- um, The epigenetic um, aspect of it. As Kate is saying, you wanna address that? Why well, and also the epigenetic aspect of that, because if your grandfather was exposed to some toxin, you'll have susceptibility 
to all kinds of illnesses as a result of his exposure two or three generations back. So it goes through the genes. It mutates genes and goes through yeah. generation to generation, which is why four generations later, all of those kids in Vietnam, the kids that we saw in the clinics, have all of these deformities and issues related to dioxin poisoning. And that's a good follow-up, a segue, if you will, to the, to the next question, which is for a lot of Americans, be it any conflict, once American combat personnel are out, it's out of sight, out of mind. However, uh, what was it, over 12% of the, the, the surface area of South Vietnam is sprayed by Agent Orange. Do, what did you find about after the unification and the establishment of, of the, the contemporary Vietnam, what steps did the country take to try and address the effects of Agent Orange on the people of the country as well as the environment itself? That happened very slowly, Frank. And um, unfortunately, Agent Orange uh, has been a very ambiguous political force and an economic force which the Vietnamese government has had to wrestle with um, uh, with uh, great care. They're concerned that if the um, world agricultural market is overly sensitized to the possibility of contamination, let's say in Vietnamese coffee, then they may stop buying that coffee. Or in um, Vietnamese fruit that is being grown and exported. Um, the Vietnamese have been very concerned about uh, possible uh, dampening effects on their tourist industry. Um, I myself in going to Vietnam and filming stood on that same barren ground that had been sprayed half a century before and um, heard Madame Tron lecture about how she had uh, been on that very same patch of ground 50 years ago and seen the river uh, contaminated. Now the Vietnamese uh, government is coming around and fighting to do whatever it can to look after the victims and also to encourage the US government to make amends, um, to provide reparations, to clean up um, the dioxin hotspots that exist particularly around the airports where uh, Agent Orange was pumped into the airplanes. That would be the Da Nang Airport and the Bien, Bien Hoa Airports where the um, concentration of contamination is enormous and the incidence of deformities resulting is very, very high. And one, our character, Madame Trantonia, also, during her time, before she came to France or became a French citizen, was uh, very active in the tourism industry. And she worked with people and raised money to build more than 200 places, clinics, uh, to take care of these kids because she's so moved by these kids. So she's been active in trying to address this. I was going to ask if you could talk a little bit about her activism and what kind of spurred her to take such a prominent role in, in Vietnam, but also now in France, to raise awareness about the effects of, the, of Agent Orange and particularly the dioxin. She was kind of born and bred in a state of war and, um, and grew up uh, an activist um, with a very heroic um, uh, leader of the uh, resistance to occupation in Vietnam, Madame Tran's mother was uh, the leader of uh, the women's coalition um, against the occupation by the French and then by the occupation by the Americans. 
Um, and um, at the age of eight, she describes herself being sent with secret messages to uh, convey to people in the resistance, messages rolled up and inserted uh, into cigarettes. She was uh, at the age of eight, an underground um, emissary, liaison. Liaison. liaison activist, and um, is uh, a no holds barred, uncompromisingly committed woman who, uh, quite like Carol Van Strum, um, will stop at nothing to uh, help humanity um, deal with a problem. And that gets into a, a little extra issue, but Carol and Madame Tron are kind of film sisters. They've never met in person, but have fallen in love with one another, it seems, um, through the film. And through us are continually uh, expressing affection and greetings to one another. Um, that's something that Carol could address. But I wanted also to add, Frank, just this little geopolitical note that because China has been incurring um, into um, Vietnamese territory by developing offshore islands as uh, South China uh, Sea. Air, Force, China, yes. Air Force bases making um, airports on these islands in the South China Firing Sea. Firing on Vietnamese fishing boats. Yep. Uh, yeah. The US as a result has seen Vietnam as a much more important um, political stronghold. And in order to enhance our position geopolitically and militarily with the Vietnamese, I think um, the US Congress has uh, been encouraged to be somewhat more generous in its relations with the Vietnamese than prior to our need for their uh, military support as well. How, how ironic can it be that 50 years after um, one of the most deadly and destructive wars the United States has ever engaged in, we're trying to ally with the people who were our enemy then um, to head off an even greater force now in the role of China. As that saying goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend to some extent. But, but you raise a fascinating point about the economic interests of Vietnam on an agricultural basis. And Carol, I have to ask, the timber from Oregon, right, is gonna be used across the United States, across the country. Has anyone done any tests to see what level of absorption there is of the dioxins in the wood oh. and the potential toxicity and contamination of these forest products being distributed uh, literally globally, so to speak. Is now, I'm not aware of the actual forest products like the finished lumber or something being tested, but there have been a number of tests on what happens if any of those things burn. In other words, just the waste products from, from milling or from construction or just from destroying old buildings so-called old buildings, um, you, and because of the residues of the herbicides themselves, even just those residues will create more dioxin when they're burned. And so, so there's, that's a real problem. It's a real problem. Also, the, if there's a forest fire, horrendous amounts of dioxin get formed from sprayed forests. So there's, there's a yeah. huge problem there too. And uh, as a dioxin, as, you know, we, we keep hearing today about forever chemicals, the, the fluorinated chemicals that are um, now ubiquitous. But you know what? This, is, this just is the latest in a whole string of them. 
starting with, well, DDT, which Rachel Carson brought to light and which was supposedly banned back in the 1970s or 60s. Yeah. Um, there is still DDT in our, some pesticides that are used today. And I remember so, telling me that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the same with dioxin. It goes out of the news, but it doesn't mean it's not there still. And so the dioxin that was in Agent Orange that is still in a number of pesticides used today um, is still out there and still being produced and uh, contaminating things. And so we, we have to look at things a little differently. And I don't know how we convince people and governments to do so, but hist history shows that none of the regulation has worked, none of it. And the comparison that comes to mind to me is something that gained global attention, which is the radioactive fallout and nuclear fallout. And we've saw this with in Chernobyl, we've saw this in Fukushima. The radionuclides will travel thousands of miles. Mm -hmm. And even if they lay dormant in the case of Chernobyl in the forests, a fire, that smoke can move the particulate matter thousands of miles in blanket Europe. The same is true as you just pointed out potentially with forest fires in Oregon, and that smoke, toxic smoke crossing over the United States. With the events in the former Soviet Union, we've seen a, a mini series on HBO, we've been books published on it, and, and, and large awareness of the dangers of, of nuclear fallout. With this documentary, Potentially, will this raise the global consideration of the dangers of mass herbicide use, particularly this past use of Agent Orange? And that's an open question for everyone. Well, you have to also remember that half of Agent Orange was 2,4-D, and it is still one, I think, just behind glyphosate or Roundup is one of the most widely used um, chemicals worldwide. Um, and the, the dioxin content of it is still basically a secret, even though EPA supposedly demanded, they rely on the chemical companies to do their own testing. And who has a better motive for um, falsifying or covering up their results than the people who make it and make a profit from it. And when I asked under Freedom of Information Act for the results of all those tests, I got four boxes of blank paper stamped confidential business information. So the first one thing we have to have to address as a nation, I believe, is lies. Is that on, on any any issue involving the health and safety of the environment or people or animals or anything else? If you have to lie about it, you not, should not be able to sell it, period. And it, that, it should be that simple. We got some good news today. Um, Frank, Car Carol is extraordinarily well-informed, I think, because people everywhere are uh, so respectful of her, of her... Um, her book, A Bitter Fog, and um, they feed her information. And today in uh, my emails, I got a, a message that uh, from Carol that I really welcomed. Do you wanna share that with, um, with the folks, Carol, what, what happened um, that was good news today? Yes, because, well, the background to this is that here in Lincoln County in Oregon, where I live, um, the people in 1917, was that? Yeah, no, 2017, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the voters in this county passed a measure banning aerial spraying of pesticides, of herbicides, pesticides, poisons, uh, anywhere within our county, which has huge amounts of especially clear-cut forests in it. And um, two years later, thanks to industry lawsuits against the county for that voters measure was overturned by the court saying that the state, 
the state legislature's laws preempted local control over whether we can be poisoned or not. And so that's that's the background to what happened today was I, and Alan, I learned this from Sharon Lerner at The Intercept. So we can credit her for letting us know that the Maine legislature, the state of Maine's legislature just passed a law or it has to be signed by the governor, but they just pa passed this bill saying that banning aerial spraying in the entire state of Maine. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so it, it's a slap in the face to our legislature, which is totally enthralled to the chemical and timber industries and would never <laughs> consider such a thing. <laughs> To my knowledge, that's the first state in the country that has banned aerial spraying of herbicides. Although um, statewide, um, although as Carol said, um, the governor has to sign that bill and uh, I hope there's no contention. I, I pity the governor if, um, if uh, there are forces at work that will prevent um, this uh, ban from taking, going into uh, effect, I think um, the governor will have to sign it. Let's hope. And, and someone that comes to mind, first off, outstanding news, uh, but Carol, you mentioned her earlier, uh, Rachel Carson, and the long lasting legacy, at least of Silent Spring to ban the widespread use of PGT, albeit there's, it's still out there. Considering the parallels between your work, uh, Alan and Kate, between your work, how did Rachel Carson's kind of journey frame the development of this documentary and, and frame your individual work in bringing attention to Agent Orange and its damning effects on the world? Well, I think she really set a precedent and inspiring um, uh, and um, incredibly effective precedent um, the success of Silent Spring and the fact that it garnered millions of readers and resulted in the ban of banning of DDT stands as a model for us um, now and an inspiration. Um, uh, I don't think any of us can pretend to be Rachel Carson's in our own right, though um, I think Carol has, uh, and with her book as well, has um, really functioned um, very, very effectively and inspiringly in a, in a similar role. I don't know if, if there will ever be another Rachel Carson who wins that much attention. Carol, do you have any theories about how she succeeded in getting that enormous readership and, and overcoming a, a chemical product that was so very widely used back then? Uh, well, okay, part of it was she had Oh, certain people that recognize the value of what she was doing. Number one, the editors at the New Yorker who serialized the book before it actually came out as a book, which brought it to the attention of a lot of people. The other thing that really helped, I think, was industry opposition. They raised such a hue and cry and tried to discredit her in so many absurd and really ugly ways that it actually pointed to her as somebody people might want to listen to because if Dow Chemical doesn't like her, there, there must be something to what she's saying. I mean, honestly, <laughs> that was, I think that helped in a, in a very warped way to keep the focus. You know, it's like negative attention being um, for a child being just as good as positive. And maybe it's the same for a book. I don't know, but, um, Certainly, they tried to discredit her just incredibly uh, nastily. And it didn't, in the long run, it didn't work. But I think that helped to publicize what 
what she was saying. And also people also noticed. She, she made people notice what was going on in their own lives. And that helped too. You know, when you had robins nesting in your yard, even in the middle of New York City, all the years of your life, and suddenly they were gone, you noticed it. And I think people realized that she really was on to something. And other scientists started noticing as well, and actually starting to look at what was happening to the, especially to the raptors, to the hawks and the falcons, and what was, why they weren't able to breed anymore. Um, and it was because of the DDT destroying the eggshells. So it, it was just a snowballing effect, I think, and it really worked. She had a fantastic title going for her with Silent Spring. And I dread to say this, but with the die off of pollinators, um, the tremendous reduction in um, the bird population, um, butterflies, monarchs uh, being only uh, perhaps 1% of uh, the population now surviving of monarch butterflies, um, bees dying back so enormously that uh, the agricultural interests need to be highly concerned um, and I have to say that the chemical industry is continuing to use uh, the same bag of tricks. Um, we had a panel discussion with a uh, biologist, Dr. Michael Skinner from Washington State, whose work probably deserves a Nobel Prize. He's the one who did the research, Kate was, just referring to about the epigenetic effects of exposure to toxins. Now get this folks, he has substantiated that exposure to toxins by us now will result as Kate said in an increased incidence of disease three or four generations ahead of us so that we are contaminating our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and the likelihood that they will contract cancers and pass on deformities is greatly heightened by that exposure to toxins. Now we talk about education, we talk about how much we wanna provide for our children and to have them have good lives. And yet we are doing next to nothing to curb the presence of toxins in our environment. And that is a curse on future generations. Well, and we're seeing today the same curse taking place from previous generations exposed things like Agent Orange or previous to that to DDT. Um, we're seeing the incredible increases in chronic diseases, which are now exceeding <laughs> or were until this latest pandemic. Um, that we're exceeding infectious diseases as killers of human beings. So that, uh, you know, and we're talking about, oh, uh, autoimmune disease is one of diseases. Things like, um, you know, Parkinson's and um, MS and lupus and other diseases that uh, skyrocketing and, instead of doing anything about it, we just allow the pharmaceutical, which is often the same as the chemical industry, um, to keep coming up with more and bizarre and often more toxic <laughs> cures for things that were caused by their products in the first place. And, and that brings us to really this legacy here, which is, and this is an open question, of course, and I know there's some of the answers are probably self-explanatory, 
What do you believe are the reasons for this utter abject failure of the Environmental Protection Agency and the Congress to ban the production and the use of not just 245T and 24D Agent Orange, but all of these other herbicides and pesticides and other incredibly toxic chemical compounds? Money. Money. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's like yeah. I mean, it, look at it this way. If, if, so, if some company wants to spray your house and your garden and your children with a poison to make a profit, there's no way you can stop them. There's no rule that says, no, they can't do that. Um, and they've co-opted the state legislatures to pass laws called right to farm laws that preempt any local attempts to prevent such a thing, including preventing you from suing those companies for the harm they've caused you. You're not allowed to do that anymore. And that's, and it's all to make a profit. It has nothing to do with, you know, spraying something that's gonna prevent a disease say, or no, it's to make a profit. So that, that's, that's the heart of the problem. As, as long as profits control what we allow to be done to us, nothing's going to change. Nothing is going to change. What can people do, Carol? What can we do to, to try to turn the tide there? Well, I'm seeing more and more, and so are you, <laughs> thanks to us. Um, <laughs> we're seeing more and more communities basically getting together and saying no and fighting these same preemption laws that have the right to farm laws that um, have been passed in state legislatures in 50 states. So you can see how widespread industries control has been and um, saying, no, we have the right to, to our health and our safety and our survival and that of our children. And they're adding that, not only adding to that, not only the right to say that for themselves, but to say it for the ecosystems that are getting destroyed and that support us all. And to me, that's very, very exciting. That, that is something that's finally coming, I think, I hope in time for, to stop some of the worst, what you call ecocide, the, the killing of things to make a profit. And part of that is the rights of nature, which, you know, Justice William O. Douglas promoted way back in 1972, just about the same time that Dr. Seuss wrote the Lorax. We should be able to speak for the trees. There's a wonderful moment in the film when Carol tells a um, hall full of uh, student environmental lawyers. Um, she says two things. One, if uh, corporations have the same rights as individuals, then they should be subjected to capital punishment just as individuals are, which is, uh, and they cheered like mad for that. And then she said, we have the right to protect ourselves from being poisoned. And we picked up that line and made it sort of the tagline on the film's poster. But truth be told, because of this dynamic of preemption, where the lobby heavy state legislatures can overturn the um, initiatives by local communities, we don't have that right to protect ourselves from being poisoned. We need to fight for that right. We need to regain that right. Um, we need to exercise that right. And a degree of uh, environmental activism beyond anything, any uh, culture on earth today has practiced will be necessary to clean this up. Let's stand there. So moving forward, what would all of you like to see accomplished with your film 
in bringing care to those affected now and in the future by Agent Orange, but this wider issue of in industrial poisoning. An end to the industrial poisoning. A stop, let people be aware, let this be an education for them. We're finding people who watch the film who are incensed right. by what has happened and that they didn't know about and that what's going on. They're angry, they wanna do something. So on our website, thepeopleversusagentorange.com, there's a page called Resources. And there you'll find all the varied organizations that are doing all kinds of things for veterans, for, for the environment, for community rights. And you can just go in there and go down a rabbit hole and pick one and follow it and find their website. It'll link you to all of these different places that are setting up little sparks throughout the country. Um, it should give people hope to get involved, to do something. And for one thing, to go out into their sheds and get rid of the stuff that they bought at the local hardware that's full of the stuff that they read the ingredients. Get it, get it out. Don't burn it, but dispose of it. And uh, don't buy that stuff. There's all kinds of alternative remedies for taking out weeds and white vinegar, so a little bit of detergent and a dash of salt, man, they're gone. And you see it happening as fast as Roundup. So I think people have to just be conscious, be aware, and know that they can turn the tide. And if there's enough of us doing it, it all starts with one person. And if each person takes it on, then there's hope, right, Carol? Yeah, uh, Jerry Spence in one of his books has a wonderful analogy. He says, giving human rights to corporations is like giving, <laughs> giving a bulldozer the same rights as an ant. And, <laughs> but take it a little further. Have you ever disturbed an anthill? What happens? Mm -hmm. ah, of them nasty. Can, they can disable a, a bulldozer. But there have to be a lot of them, and that's where we're at. We people have got to just get together and say no, no. And you know, we've had mass demonstrations for Black Lives Matter for all kinds of issues. Well, how about survival of the planet being a big issue? And yes, I love people like Greta Thunberg, but I think we need way more of her. Thank you. And. I hope the film will create a whole bunch of those people and they'll just say no, say no, not only to these poisons, but to the money that enables them mm -hmm. and that pays our, our legislators. I mean, that lobbyists and chemical company donations to campaigns can control our lives is, uh, it's appalling. And people need to realize that, and they don't. I mean, people have very complicated, difficult lives. I, I understand that. And, but survival is kind of, should take precedence over whether people get to travel or do whatever they do for leisure. And hopefully things like this pandemic have shown them what can happen when we don't pay attention. Mm -hmm. And ask questions. Uh, there's a moment not far into the film when Carol says, everybody just assumed if the government was doing it, it was okay. <laughs> we need to question what our government is doing. We need to take charge. We cannot be passive. If we're passive, we're diseased, if we're passive, we're deformed, if we're passive, we're contaminated. Um, uh, you wouldn't allow anyone to knowingly poison you or your children, would you? I often wonder about the captains of industry who are making the decisions to put toxins out into the environment, don't they know them that they are poisoning their own children 
and their grandchildren and themselves, they're breathing the same air. In all probability, they're drinking the same water, eating the same food. Yeah, we have to be really careful. Um, Daryl Ivey, the guy, the helicopter service guy in the film who's making those incredible cell phone videos to show the uh, contamination of public uh, uh, drinking water in the reservoirs uh, in Oregon. Um, he's become a health fanatic. He wants to teach everyone how to live without exposure to toxins, certainly to eat all organically, um, to uh, protect themselves um, with an initiatives that every one of us can do, um, but so few of us know enough to do. And um, yeah, Frank, one of the things I really hope uh, the film can do is to encourage conversations like the one we're having now. I'm deeply grateful, Kate, too. All of us on the film team are so grateful to the Smithsonian for programming this this way and for supporting uh, the film and uh, reaching out um, through the, the film club, um, History Film Club, um, to encourage view to, viewership and to ask those vital questions. Uh, and we'll keep asking the questions and demanding that the answers be suitable uh, to our own future. And ask for the data. <laughs> Give us the numbers. Really, uh, that's so important is not to take anyone's word for granted. You know, the, the prevalence of not just advertising, but just promotion of horrible things is so widespread, people don't realize how little knowledge is actually behind them. And I think it's so important to say, when, when they're told something is safe, say, show me the studies and show me the raw data and show me that they're really safe. And if you can't do that, you can't expose me. And no, very few people have the wherewithal to say that, but it's important that we all start saying it. And that, and that leads to my final two questions. And actually, Carol, I'll ask the first one to you. The documentary does a fantastic job of discussing the poison papers and the digitization effort of your mass archive that you have, you have created over the ensuing decades. As a historian and a curator, uh, are you working or hopefully working with an archive for the permanent preservation of the physical records somewhere? Well, the physical records were in such bad shape. They were unsavable in many cases. And that's why we digitized them all. Um, and they, <laughs> they actually uh, destroyed the floor of the place that I was storing them. They were so heavy. Um, so they're, they're basically, although some of them still haven't been digitized and there are still quite a few documents that remain because we ran out of funding um, to have them put up there, but they are at least being preserved in several different places up on the Poison Papers um, site on, and also by Columbia University and their toxic docs. And they have actually been adding to them as we're able to upload things. So um, they're preserved electronically anyway. Outstanding. And then the last, the last question I have, and then uh, I have to go get to my son who's been awake now for like the past 40 minutes. And oh no. Rolling around his crib because I have the baby monitor here. <laughs> <laughs> Good, give um, him a hug for us. He's a ha happy little fellow, I must say. He's, he's just playing yeah. up there for the moment. Yeah. But for all the viewers of this film, uh, particularly those who you can't not be moved by the footage of the, vic the, the current generation of victims in Vietnam. What can viewers do to help the victims of Agent Orange in Vietnam today and in the United States? Well, they can um, support initiatives uh, being taken to uh, help those victims in Vietnam. Um, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee 
um, every year um, uh, votes on um, the degree to which uh, they will try to remedy um, the problems that we've left in Vietnam, the legacy, um, as our for, uh, colleague Susan Hammond says, the war legacy has been despicable. And that's the name of her project, the War Legacies Project that supports many of these victims. She goes there every year with all kinds of materiel and uh, what wheelchairs and uh, prosthetics and all kinds of things that she brings from people who have been donating to her organization called yeah. the War Legacies Project, which is on our resources page. And, he and another character in the film, um, Heather, Bowser. Heather Bowser's organization, the woman who's interviewed by um, Trantonia. Um, Children has, of Vietnam Veterans Health Alliance. It's also on our resources page. And they're all involved, and she's involved with uh, American veterans, children. So, Donations to either of those organizations, War Legacies yes. Project or More direct. Children of Vietnam Veterans Health Alliance will help it all a lot. There's also a new bill which uh, Representative Barbara Lee has introduced again, reintroduced after I think maybe five or 10 years of attempting to get Congress to support these um, health um, related initiatives in Vietnam. Um, but that's going to take a good deal of a political change before the American Congress will really bite the bullet and try to do something significant to make up for the damage that we did so ruthlessly and so heedlessly in Vietnam. No country has ever experienced um, such a tyrannical reign of terror as the deliberate uh, contamination of um, Vietnam society uh, from 61 to 71. Um, it's been compared, uh, and even when you mentioned um, the nuclear fallout, Frank, um, it's been compared to uh, uh, nuclear weaponry. And yes, David Zeiler uh, refers to Agent Orange as a weapon of mass destruction. Absolutely. One thing holding that up, I believe, is the fact that if we give reparations or whatever you call it to the Vietnamese people, at some point they're going to have to consider something similar to the same victims in this country mm -hmm. who have been affected mm -hmm. profoundly. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the children born with Down syndrome, with, with birth defects from kidney deformities to other um, debilitating things. And to say nothing of the children that never got born at all, you know, that were, that we, we had one woman put up a sign, it didn't last long, on the highway here saying, <laughs> free abortions, call U.S. Forest Service, and she gave their local number. Um, there were so many people, women miscarrying. I mean, when, when all of the women in the first trimester in an area that got sprayed miscarried, the, it's kind of hard to ignore an EPA's own study showing what happened, of course, was suppre suppressed mightily. The scientists who did it were prevented by armed guards from presenting their data at scientific conferences. They were never allowed to publish it. Uh, so you, uh, the people in this country who were affected have, I don't think as equal, a horrendous story to tell as the Vietnamese. But I think the fact that there are so many of them might make helping the Vietnamese, make, make the government helping them uh, pause because the next step would be helping the people in this country too. The cost is enormous not to. The cost of supporting our, the U.S. veterans who have been exposed to Agent Orange, 
uh, is in the many billions of dollars. Um, the cost of um, remedying all of these health um, issues uh, is enormous. Um, there is no justification for ignoring um, the consequences of putting these toxins into the environment. Speaking on behalf here of, of Chris and Smithsonian Affiliates, thank you all. You've made a tremendous contribution to the world's awareness, not just America's awareness or Vietnam's awareness, but the world's awareness of the dangers of Agent Orange. And uh, God willing, this will begin to move an avalanche of change that we desperately need in this country and the world community as a whole. Okay. Thanks to the Smithsonian. Everyone can see the, the film on the 28th of June. Um, on PBS. On PBS. Check your local stations for timing. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks to the Smithsonian Institute. We're deeply grateful for the exposure.